Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. Now, I've been involved in this world of IT since the very early 80s. And, uh, you know, back then it was a whole different world. Obviously, we had uh, the use of mainframes, we were using tape drives. You know, I first started trying to do any programming, I was punching cards and feeding them into a machine to be able to get an answer of like six or five or whatever the answer was. Um, and I've seen a lot of things change over time. I've worked with a lot of different uh, operating systems, a lot of different network operating systems, worked in the infrastructure as well, the routing, switching, and security realms. Uh, I was around to watch this transition of, uh, of Novell becoming big and popular, and then suddenly here comes this Windows NT thing in the mid-90s, 1996, and just taking over the network world by, uh, by force. I mean, well, not force, but just going crazy and with all these features and things. And, and I got right on that bandwagon. I've been following along with uh, Windows ever since then. Through the use of Windows 2000 into the 2003 server, here to 2008, supporting all of the different uh, workstation operating systems, uh, and being able to uh, continue to, to see the uh, great features and the uh, changes in the development. Of course, like I said, through that same period of time, I had the opportunity to also work on the infrastructure side. Uh, that is, working with the Cisco's and the Junipers and the routing and the switching, the security platforms. And I do a lot of work in the security hacking realm as well. Now, I guess you might say, well, that sounds like a lot of different things, but you got to remember, I'm talking over 30 years of being able to be in this business. So I've had the chance to explore a different uh, avenue or two, and I hope to be able to bring all of that experience to you as we go through this course and we talk about the Windows 2008 server. In this chapter, we're going to start with a foundation of the actual network communications, and that is to uh, understand the underlying way in which we get the communications to happen from server to server over our IP-based networks. We're going to begin with the uh, discussion of the Open Systems Interconnect model, it's the OSI model. We're going to see how that applies as an open standard to the IP uh, model that we see, what we call the TCP IP suite. And then we'll talk mostly about the IP version 4. That's what we're currently working with on most of our networks. We're going to talk about uh, the way in which you can distinguish the network portion of that address versus the host portion. We're also going to look at ways in which we can increase how many uh, actual networks we get out of each and every address through the use of subnetting. Then we're going to talk about IP version 6. Now IP version 6 is the replacement. It is the future. It's here today. We'll make some, uh, some contrasts uh, as far as how is it different than IP4 and why did we need it. And then, of course, we're going to look at how you actually configure the IP4 addresses inside of the Windows uh, operating systems, whether on the workstation or on the server. Let's start off with the discussion of the OSI model. Now, that stands for the Open Systems Interconnect, and what we're going to look at is a, ver a variety of layers, what we call the layers of the OSI. There are seven of them, and we'll make sure that you understand how they are uh, set up, what they mean for us. We'll look at uh, the process of taking the actual raw information we want to exchange from one end station to another end station through the encapsulation process, and then once it's received, the de-encapsulation process. And then we'll take a look at how the OSI model maps with that current uh, structure that we utilize called the TCP IP model. When we talk about the network layers, it's important that you have the big picture uh, to understand the conceptual steps that go on through the network communications. And if you think about it, the ultimate goal is to take some bit of data that we want to be able to send from one system to another. And in that process, we're going to start adding information to be able to help us in the transmission of that information from one host to the next. So what goes on then is that we uh, basically go through these layers of constructing and then, of course, once I receive that packet, deconstructing that information so that I can utilize the data. We often call that process the encapsulation process as we uh, are uh, getting ready to send that information. And once we receive it, we will then de-encapsulate the information. Now, that means that the layers do the work in both directions. They add information on encapsulation. They take information off de-encapsulation. But more than that, they also provide information that helps them uh, to be able to progress to the next layer. Often we call that a PDU, the protocol data units, the information that's being uh, transmitted from one to the other. Now, the goal is to say that because of the way the layers do work in uh, some autonomy, that I could replace one of those layers without having to uh, worry about how it works with the uh, layer above or below. And, uh, and that's kind of the, the goal that we try to have to make it easy to be able to transition to new technologies. As an example, there for a while, this uh, company, network company called Novell was utilizing a layer 3 logical address called IPX. The rest of the world was using IP. 
Yet both companies could still use a transport protocol of TCP. Both companies could still work with uh, Ethernet because they constructed that layer three of the IP address or the IPX address, depending on which one it was, to be able to interoperate with the layers above and below it. And uh, we're seeing it again. As we're going from an IP version 4 address space now to an IP version 6 address space, we're seeing again the same ability to be able to just replace that little bit of that layer, put something new in there, and it's still able to communicate from the top to the bottom. Now, when we talk about those layers, you're going to see all sorts of information, but the idea of uh, when people say, well, why do I need all these layers? Well, you know, if you think about it, just if I think about the lower, lower layers, uh, as I got that little bit of uh, data and I want to start sending it, we utilize a language that both hosts can speak so they know how to reconstruct the information. That's that TCP stuff. We have to have a logical address available so that the routing layer knows how to uh, deliver this thing to a destination that's at least close uh, to where the host is located. Then in the actual local area network, we have switches that are utilizing some sort of media address, typically Ethernet's MAC address. So we have that information added into it. And then at some point we have to convert all of that data into a bunch of ones and zeros so it can be transmitted across that copper wire, fiber connection, radio frequency, or whatever we're doing at the media layer. And so that's what the purpose of the encapsulation process is to be able to help us at all aspects of uh, that transmission. And, and you'll see that as we talk about the uh, OSI layers in a little bit more detail. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. But conceptually, it's just important that you understand uh, how the layers are uh, a bit autonomous and designed to work with the layers above and below in the uh, process of being able to encapsulate and decapsulate the information uh, that is being transmitted between two hosts. Now, there are other transport layers out there. In the days of old, when Novell was uh, very popular, it had its own proprietary transport, uh, transport protocol called SPX. Now, it operated in much the same way as, as the transport layer, but they had their own method of communication that worked very well. And I'm not saying whether it was great or, or not great. One of the things that was important to remember, it was a proprietary. And so uh, history has shown us that many proprietary protocols died of boredom because nobody used them. They didn't want to pay the royalty fees. So SPX and uh, at the network layer, IPX were some other examples though, of the transport layer. But another one that you'll come across here in Windows is the UDP, the User Datagram Protocol. Now UDP's job is to be what they call connectionless, and that doesn't sound really good. Because to me, if you tell me it's connectionless, I'm thinking, eh, why do I want to use it? Let's instead call it an unacknowledged protocol. Unacknowledged just simply means that I'm sending this uh, packet out and there'll be no way for me to know whether or not you received it because you will not acknowledge to me that it, was, uh, that it made its way. Now you might ask, well, what good is this protocol? The good in the protocol is that it has a lot lower overhead because it doesn't have all of the session control stuff that TCP has. And it's great for being able to do things like broadcast traffic or multicast traffic where I want to send just one stream out and either you get it or you don't. And so those are some of the benefits of, benefits of UDP. Now it still is going to operate in segments in that it's going to send a piece of traffic to you um, with each of the, of the uh, packets that you receive. You're going to have a, a series of data. If they come to you out of order, then things are going to be mixed up because you won't know which order they're supposed to be in. It's basically going to come to you in the order received. So let me talk about a popular use for UDP that we see growing in our networks, and that's for the voice over IP. Now the voice over IP uses user datagram protocol, but it also has an extra uh, part of that encapsulation called RTP, the real-time protocol, whose job is to help make sure that you get everything in certain time segments so if a packet comes out of order, you know that it's out of order by its timestamp, you drop it, because we are just interested in sending to you the voice traffic in the order in which um, it was sent. So again, lots of examples, they're just languages. Now, how do I know how to get from where I am to where you are? And we do that at the network layer. The network layer, layer three, is designed to help create what we call broadcast domains. The idea of a broadcast domain is to say that I don't want the entire world to all be in one network, where if one person sends a broadcast, 10 billion other computers get that broadcast. Instead, we cons consolidate that network into small segments where broadcast traffic can't penetrate outside of its little area. 
but because it is a logical addressing scheme, we need to know how do I identify my broadcast domain versus your broadcast domain and get my traffic to you. And we do that through an address scheme called the IP, the Internet Protocol. Now, at, with the IP um, settings, the IP version 4, we're going to learn that there's a network portion and that there's a host portion. And the network portion describes the address of your broadcast domain. A lot of work has been uh, done to make sure that nobody has the same broadcast domain in the public realm. So there's a lot of things that we want to uh, actually go into and explore when we talk about IP. But we use devices like routers to be able to help us make decisions about where or, and what is the best path to get to that particular network ID. Now, once we get to your network, and we call those, by the way, we call them packets, once we get that packet to you uh, th through whichever router is closest to you, then it enters into what we like to call the physical uh, aspects of the, of the network. But before we get there, it's actually called the local area network. We call that layer two the data link layer. Now, the data link layer is just an encapsulation protocol that is designed for the communications in that local area. And I know that sounds like I'm speaking in circles, but think of it this way. Uh, between routers, there is a, a link of some kind, whether it's um, going to be a fiber cable, a copper cable, radio frequency, microwave, satellite communications, there's a link. And that particular link, the equipment in between the two routers, has its own method of communicating. In some cases, it might use ATM. It might use frame relay. It could use some old X25. It could be using um, you know, a number of things like PPP, and, and we can continue to go on and talk about all of these encapsulation protocols. But what's important is, is that we take this packet and encapsulate it with the information at layer 2, data link, to make it through these uh, devices. Well, since I've just described this packet getting to the router closest to you, and now it's in your local area network, the odds are that you're in an Ethernet-based network. And Ethernet is another Layer 2 protocol. And so the data link layer contains information that your switches or your bridges can use to help uh, finalize the delivery of this uh, packet, but at Layer 2 they like to call them frames. And finally, of course, there's the actual turning all of this information into a bunch of ones and zeros so that it can be transmitted on all of those physical mediums that I just talked about. And when I say physical, of course, again, that's copper, fiber, radio frequency, um, the microwave stuff, uh, infrared, the uh, communications through uh, satellites, which may still be radio frequency of some sort. But there's a lot of aspects of the physical side of this. Um, and that's another part of the communication we call layer one. All right, so a lot of things that I've just thrown out at you with the OSI model. Remember that as I start from the application layer where I first had the data and I was going to break it into pieces, the very first place, the transport layer where I created the segment, I'm going to encapsulate, in other words, take your data and add to the front of it the information for the receiving host on how to put this data back together. I'm going to add on top of that the IP address of where I want my router to send it. On top of that will be added the data link encapsulation to get it out of my local area network to my router and from that router to every other hop in between until it arrives at its destination. So interestingly, interestingly enough, the data link portion of, of this transmission is constantly changing as it goes from your local area network to your service provider's wide area network to the other service provider's wide area network to the local area network of the receiving host. And it, it will constantly change because it needs to get through those individual networks. And all of that is going to be done on a lot of different physical media. So it could cross from copper, copper wire to, to um, uh, the, the fibers and all the way through. So that's the entire idea of what we're doing with the OSI model. And hopefully I've made sense about each of these different pieces as we talk about them a little bit later. later. And again, we're going to focus on talking about uh, IP in this chapter so that we have an understanding of what we need to configure for our uh, Windows servers and our clients to be able to make them communicate with the network and, of course, with the data link layers. So as I talked about the OSI model, what I described was what we call the encapsulation process. Encapsulation was just simply taking the original piece of data and at every layer in the OSI model adding some more information to it to help facilitate the communications. Now, 
as I talked about going from the data layer, we added on this transport layer stuff. Uh, we imagine if, in my example, uh, we're using TCP, we would add things like a sequence number, uh, port numbers to know which application I want to talk to on the other side. Uh, that information would help us in being able to get the receiving host to know which application is going to deal with the data, sequence number, which order the data should be reconstructed. And there's other things that are in the, that headers that also help us with communications, things like what they call the, the windowing or the, the sliding uh, windows for flow control and many other pieces that uh, this course really isn't going to get into. But it's important information to know that it, that it needs to be put into this process of encapsulation. And as I went through the uh, layer three, we put the IP address on. We had to put the, the source where we are coming from, the destination IP address. Then there's this whole issue of doing NATing, which we'll talk about later on when we uh, try to describe the process of going from private addresses to public. Then at layer two, we're going to put in the encapsulation protocol that makes sense for the local area network that we're in at that, the point of transmission. And at that, we also create what's called the frame check sequence, which is nothing more than a mathematical computation that allows every device down the, downstream to know whether or not the uh, actual packet has been uh, destroyed by any other type of uh, interference. And then we push it out onto the physical layer, which is where we've turned it into a bunch of ones and zeros, and we transmit it across some physical link. So let's say uh, we talk about uh, sending the file from our server to whoever's requested it. In my local Ethernet network, I would have to, uh, at layer two, add on an Ethernet encapsulation that included what we call the MAC addresses, the media access controls, of all of the different uh, devices I need to cross through to get to the um, point where my router can then send it across this uh, internet link. Well, that information will be stripped off, that layer two is stripped off by the router. A new layer two would be put on to match whatever its wide area network is going to be, whether again, frame relay, point to point, ATM, uh, whatever that case may be, and sending it on its way across the internet. And uh, so that layer two keeps changing, as I said, literally from hop to hop. Now, the receiving side is going to do the reverse process called de-encapsulation. De-encapsulation means that the, the receiving host is going to be looking at these ones and zeros that come across its network card. And it's going to read the, uh, the um, what they call basically the, the headers of this uh, ones and zeros. They're going to put it together and it's going to say, okay, I recognize this as uh, Ethernet. I recognize my MAC address, so it tears its MAC address off. It looks at the IP portion and says, yep, that's definitely my IP portion. It remembers the source, so it knows who to reply to, and strips that IP address off. It sees the TCP information and says, oh great, this is uh, sequence number one. So this is the first of my, of my segments, and I want to know that uh, I'm going to attach that to sequence number two and three and four and reassemble my data just as it is. And because it says it's port whatever, I know which application was calling for this information, it strips that information off, and then there's the data segment where it can deal with uh, the presentation, the application can use that information once it's all assembled. So as I said, that's the process of encapsulation from the sender to the de-encapsulation of the receiver. And of course, this process can go back and forth as we exchange information. Most often, when it comes to file transfers, we're going to see more packets from the sender uh, than we're going to see from the receiver. The receiver needs only to send an, uh, an acknowledgement to let us know that you got those packets. Now, because of this process of encapsulation and de-encapsulation being done at every layer, as I said earlier, you can change something about a layer in how it does its work as long as the layer above it and below it uh, can see the same information that they need to do their job, then this works. So as an example, at the uh, layer three, the network layer, when we go from an IP4 address to an IP6 address, as long as the transport layer above it and the network layer below it can deal with that traffic, then things should be able to work very well for us. It makes the scalability and the ability to change things very easy. And it was designed to help uh, give us an open protocol so that there's no proprietary issues here. And again, like I said, Novell did have its own IPX, SPX that worked at these uh, layers, just as I described, but they did create their own protocols. And of course, if you try to use that now, you'll see that the, everybody's generally agreed on, let's use IP4 and move to IP6. All right, so I've talked about TCP IP, and TCP IP actually has its own layer um, design.
They have four layers instead of seven, but they map pretty nicely with the OSI model. Now the TCP IP model did predate the OSI model. The TCP IP model was nearly as old as I am, and I'm not going to tell you how old that is, but it's been around. Um, the OSI layer was dis, uh, developed by the uh, International Standards Organization, the ISO, in, uh, in the time in which they were also working on creating a replacement for the uh, IP and TCP IP protocols. So that's why the model doesn't really mimic the TCP IP model because they had their own, uh, I think it was called CLNS protocol, and it's still out there by the way. It's still in use with uh, some of its routing aspects. But anyway, they do map closely to each other. In the TCP IP model, they take the upper layers, layers 7, 6, and 5, and they just call it the application layer. Now TCP has some of the applications we talked about, HTTP, FTP, and those uh, capabilities. It deals with its own session control. It has all of the same capabilities as we saw in layers 7, 6, and 5. It has a transport layer for TCP, for UDP. Uh, also know that at the TCP IP model, there are other transport layer options and they exist in the OSI model too and most often those are routing protocols so uh, if I'm doing OSPF or ISIS we have some different types of communications that can occur um, at layer 4 but remember transport layer just meant it's a common language we're willing to speak they have a layer 3 for the IP addresses but theirs is called the internet layer as opposed to the network layer but functionally for us it's uh, when dealing with IP we're talking about the same uh, capabilities and of course, there are other tools that live at these layers, uh, messaging protocols and, uh, and tools that we use for determining whether or not connections are valid. And then in TCP IP, they have um, one last layer that is the same as the layers 2 and layer 1 for the OSI model. They call that the data link layer. And there we would see the, um, uh, the different types of, uh, of frame types for Ethernet. Um, we would see the physical um, information about how to send this uh, or basically how to serialize the information over copper or over fiber and the rest of it. So the TCP IP model, we, as I said, predated and so it was kind of an idea of, of a framework to start with as we moved into um, the use of, of TCP IP in a larger scale than it ever had been before and that is to move it into the OSI model. Now like I said, the OSI model was genu genuinely designed way back then uh, as, as a way of creating a structure so that we could migrate from TCP IP into other protocols. The thought process was is that TCP IP was great for the military, great for the universities and, and their old um, you know, precursor to the internet, but the thought of whether or not it would scale out well uh, if we wanted to keep that or use something else, during that transition time we came up with the OSI model. Uh, we are obviously still using IP and uh, TCP and we're going to continue to use that in some form as we, uh, in the foreseeable future. But I really want you to focus on the OSI model so you understand uh, how all of the different pieces interact.